Hi, I'm Sterling Parent, and I'm here with Tim Pinnell from Juniper Networks, and we're talking today about Cloud Metro uh, and the applicability of Cloud Metro to, to 5G transport. Okay. Two, two things I'm following closely. Uh, nice good, chat. Yes. Yeah. So, um, Cloud Metro, we, we've talked before a bit about the, about the concept in general, but how, how does that apply to um, uh, the, the mobile networks in terms of drivers? So, first of all, uh, it's worth saying that Cloud Metro is, is really if you like, extensions to what we would perhaps call traditional metro or traditional access aggregation. So there are some enhancements that we feel that we need to make in the metro space. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't use cloud metro to deploy traditional metros. Mm -hmm. The opposite, of course, is not true because of the enhancements. And those enhancements that, that we make are primarily uh, around a few areas. So a key one is, is automation um, and, and bringing really cloud-delivered, uh, AI-enabled automation to the Metro platforms. Uh, another key one is we really want to, given the traffic demands that, that 5G is, is driving on the networks, uh, we, we don't believe it's sustainable to have network operators you know, continually upgrading their install base all of the time to cope with the increasing traffic. So we're trying to drive a, a set of products uh, from the small through all, all the way through the large, which are, from a, a longevity perspective, in terms of how long they're in the network, can have a longer horizon. So just trying to reduce the carbon footprint of the overall network by avoiding some of those upgrade steps. And then the last piece is really trying to redefine a little bit what we feel a, a 5G IP services fabric should, should have as a baseline. So, of course, IP services level connectivity in the fabric, uh, whether it's traditional metro or cloud metro, you know, spine leaf architectures are becoming more, more common. But beyond all of that connectivity type of discussion, really talking about uh, an IP services fabric that is both assured from a, a services perspective and also secured from a, an end-to-end -end security perspective. Okay, yeah, and you, you mentioned actually a, n a number of different um, points that get made in, in our discussions with operators and, and, yeah. and in our surveys. We did a survey uh, earlier around cloud metro and network modernization, and one of the key findings from that was the, the, the importance, the top priority given to reliability in, yes. in 5G networks specifically. Yeah. How does the cloud metro directly contribute to improved reliability for an operator? So, so one of the things, again, really comes back to the automation side of things. So when we think about reliability of networks, of course, you can go back to, you know, individual platform MTBFs and things like that, um, and the way that we build those networks. Really, in those areas, there's nothing particularly about the cloud metro architecture that is significantly different to what we do in traditional metro network architectures. So, you know, we still, like I said, those spine leaf approaches that we have been building for a while in traditional uh, metro architectures, we keep those. Uh, generally, if you think about a scale-out architecture, which is something that we see more of, and certainly we advocate as part of Cloud Metro, with a, a spine layer and then you know different leaves depending on the services you need to build. Scaling out that spine layer does move you away from that kind of one plus one type hub nodes that we had in the past with our aggreg aggregation networks. That in general makes it more reliable. But I think if we if we think about some of the major differences between traditional metro and cloud metro, really again we come back to that automation and that service assurance, both of which are really very much focused around uptime of the network right. and guaranteeing the services that are going across them, really trying to get away from the manual operations in towards um, that AI-enabled operations mode where you get insights and things that are difficult to spot without those end-to-end -end network insights that the, the AI and the automation gives you, things it's very hard to you know, whether it's black hole det detection or optical impairments, things like this, stuff that is very hard to identify and to spot without that end-to-end -end view and without that uh, that automated AI view. So it brings a level of uptime to the network that was not there previously, mm -hmm. and uptime, at the end of the day, is reliability. reliability. Yeah, yeah. And an interesting point. A another important point that came through from our that uh, Cloud Metro survey uh, was the importance for network modernization around automation, and you've talked a bit about automation. One of the interesting areas that Juniper is moving into is automation in the cloud, uh, kind of a new concept. Can you talk a little bit about that and specific to, again, to the 5G yeah, very, networks? very much so. So moving to the cloud rapidly is, is definitely 
a, a leadership step that we're taking there. We, we feel it's important. Essentially, we're, we're taking proven technology that we've had as part of our MIST solution from an AI perspective and moving that into the, the metro domain. And that's, that's part of our, our cloud metro solution. And, and why is that important? Well, again, it, it's, if you think about why we put things into the cloud and why we share information like that, it's because it means that rather than everybody doing their own automation solution or operation solution in silos, now we have basically shared knowledge pool, which goes into that AI and that, that machine learning, if you like. And that really allows us from the get-go basically to say to a customer, okay, why don't we partner, you know, log on to Paragon Cloud, and you can actually be productive in minutes. Mm. And you also get the benefit of baked in AI that's already there. And that, that AI that's already there comes not from them, because they've never used it before, but from their peers who have already been using the platform and who may have found problems that they're going to experience. And so it allows you to move away from kind of being reactive in terms of, of responding to problems in the network to being a little bit more predictive and to being proactive and saying, hey, here's something happening or something that's going to happen. Maybe you want to be proactive in doing something about that before it impacts your service. Now, there's a lot of debate about, you know, we talk to customers and they're like, oh, cloud. Yes. And, and the thing is, is what is cloud, right? It, it, it can have very many different meanings depending on your context. Yes, it can mean a global cloud, can be some Amazon service that everyone is sharing globally. Generally, that's not going to work for most of our service provider customers. In fact, there are laws in certain countries that says, no, you have to keep the cloud within our country. Mm -hmm. And even beyond that, for some of our customers, they're not even comfortable with that. They don't want to share necessarily with their neighbor. Yes, they want to have the benefit of the shared learning, but the idea of having some management link into a shared cloud, mm -hmm. they they have worries about security. And so from that perspective, the cloud could actually be a private cloud just for that service provider. Right. And all of their network systems can share that cloud, but it's only for that customer. So the concept of cloud enabled you know, automation as a service, it can be private cloud, it can be national cloud, it can be theater specific clouds. It has a different meaning for different people, but we're going to have to do all of those. Right, and it's yeah. kind of an evolution. The more exactly. cautious we'll start private and then maybe move things to, to the public over yeah. time. Um, last topic is on uh, Metro, um, not Metro, but um, open networks for, for the Metro. Open, it's hard to talk to an operator without being asked about open. Can you just address Cloud Metro in the context of, uh, of where it's open? I mean, I think generally, if you look at, at Juniper's history, it's, it's very much about open standards open everything. Um, we don't really see any benefit from a Juniper perspective or for our customers making something to closed architecture. Um, there are closed architectures out there, I won't mention them, um, but generally it's not good for the industry if something is closed. Actually, solutions generally get better if we have competition. We all improve the solution. We want Cloud Metro not to be a Juniper thing, but to be an industry thing. We believe that it's something that the industry needs. Um, we're responding to shifts and, and trends that we already see happening. We're helping to push the envelope on those, but ultimately it's only going to be successful if the whole industry agrees and converges around driving that solution. So absolutely has to be open, um, whether it's you know open config and all of the you know uplinks that we have to the automation side of thing, mm -hmm. whether it's all of the same standard MEF, IETF, ITU, <laughs> IEEE, etc. They're all the same standards that we have on our traditional metro. We're just doing a few extra things around, like I said, the automation, yeah. again, standards based, around some of what we expect, and again with you know some of the enhancements we're making around security and and you know, monitoring of services. Uh, up the application there, it's all standards-based information. So we don't want to close everything down. It has to be open. That's the only way that Cloud Metro as an, an industry solution will be successful. All right, excellent. Appreciate your time and perspective and uh, wish you luck. Thank you very Thanks. much. Good talk to you, Tim. Cheers. Bye.